Hi, this is George Buza, and you're listening to the FSF Popcast. The show that made Professor X provide his legs with the will to get up and walk out of the room. Our show is brought to you by our charity sponsor, the Red Shirt Widows and Orphans Fund, which supports the Wish Upon a Teen Foundation that helps out sick kids when they need it most. And just imagine the comfort you'll give Red Shirt crewman number 1997. He'll know that when he puts on the Red Shirt and joins the X-Men in their fight against the Sentinels, that he didn't leave his family destitute and without hope, because the Red Shirt Widows and Orphans Fund has his back and what's left of his fur. All right, guys, our guest today is a prolific voiceover talent and a man who's been entertaining people for generations. I am one of those peoples. Uh, Perhaps you know him best in the same way I learned of him, and that is as the voice of Beast in the 1990 animated series, The X-Men. But we have so much more to talk with him about than just the X-Men. We're going to talk about some X-Men. Don't worry about that. But there's some other things that we want to talk to George Buza about today. So welcome to the FSF Popcast, George. Well, thank you very much. Happy to be here. Yeah, uh, we're excited. So we uh, we met George at the Grand Rapids Comic Con. Uh, Himself and a lot of the other cast from the X-Men animated series were there, along with Eric and Julia Lee Wald, who were on a previous episode of the FSF podcast. Uh, but we had a chance to talk with George, and, and he graciously agreed to come on tonight and talk with us. So that's why we have him here. And I have to tell you, I'm excited to, to talk with you uh, about all things X-Men. We know that there's X-Men 97 coming. We're not going to ask you a lot of details about that, because that's all strapped down with NDAs. Uh, but and Disney scares us. And Disney scares me. They have they have enough money to sell me twice before lunchtime and not you know not blink an eye. Um, well, they do I've, own the Sentinels now. Yeah, well, <clears throat> there's a, there's a lot there to worry about for sure. <laughs> but I found something on your IMDb list as I was going through your your resume of shows. I found something on your IMDb list that I knew that this had to be the first thing I was going to talk to you about. And I guarantee you it's not X-Men related. Well, I take that back. I mean, it could be. There might be a tie-in here somewhere that I'm clearly unaware of. And if there is, by God, that would be an awesome story. Uh, Anyway, the show that I want to ask you about has one of my favorite quotes. It says, if the women don't find you handsome, they should at least find you handy. How did you end up on the Red Green Show? I think they just kind of asked me to be on it. They were looking for another character. And uh, they just asked me if I would come in and play this uh, uh, lazy marina owner. And uh, we took it to the absolute limit where uh, he just wouldn't even move a muscle for fear of exerting himself and created that extreme (laughs) character. It was a heck of a lot of fun to do. Oh, I bet. It was a a very fun cast. And uh, I'd known all the guys that were on that show for years before. And uh, I had the time of my life as long as it lasted. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, that's one of those shows that when I was growing up, I didn't understand it at first. I was kind of young, but one of my buddy's dads watched the show, and he just thought it was hysterical. He thought Red Green was the cat's pajamas. And so, um, you know, I just, but as I got older and I kind of went back and watched it a little bit, it made me laugh because as an adult, the humor in it registered with me more than when I was a teenager. Um, so, yeah, and that quote, like I said, that quote has been, uh, that stuck around with me because I am not a very uh, handy person, nor am I handsome. So um, I, I've tried to figure out a way to make that work for me. But but do you know how to use a roll of duct tape? Oh, you know, I'm I've awesome. been using duct tape all my life. You know, that's one of those things that <laughs> the reason it was so popular in the show is because everybody did it. If you needed to fix something. I fixed mufflers on my old cars with duct tape. You know, it didn't Absolutely. last very long, but uh, it got you from point A to point B, and then it melted. Right. It's helpful it to ca- keep in your car for when your muffler falls off as you're That's trying right. to get it to the I shop. I put bumpers back on a car with duct tape. I've done all kinds of things with it. And this is way before I was on the Red Green Show and actually learned that you could build things with duct tape, too. Oh, yeah, <laughs> absolutely. One of my favorite stories is, my, so my son and I were driving out to Colorado, and we had bought a, a car a little while before this. And we were driving out and we had just gotten through Nebraska. We were coming into Colorado. And as you come in through that way, the elevation starts to climb. Well, we didn't realize that the radiator wasn't working. The radiator fan wasn't working. 
we found that um, out as we started to climb the mountain because the car was uh, yes was fighting us a little bit but we got under the hood with duct tape and zip ties and we moved a few things around we made a few things work we kind of you know we figured it all out but there was a mechanic involved too don't i it, like it wasn't like i fixed it all so let's not let's not go there uh but <laughs> it worked so obviously as we were under the hood my son uh and I, I the name of the show escapes me right now but goodness gracious uh it was it was on motor trend channel and there was these two guys they would always go and they'd get these junk cars and try and fix them up and all this stuff and they always had zip ties with them so before we left he made sure we had zip ties and i grew up watching the red green show and in my especially in my early 20s and i'm like i got duct tape he's got zip ties we're good to go for a road trip <laughs> they both came in handy and i'm like and as i'm duct taping things i was like red green would be so proud right now <laughs> As soon as you mentioned Red Green, I'm over here with you. Where can I watch it? Because oh, I suddenly need to watch it so badly. Like It used to run profusely on PBS. It yeah. did. It did. But I'm, take a look on YouTube. Everything yeah. seems to be out there. I'm looking now, and it looks like you can stream it on Tubi, the Roku channel. You can buy it through Prime. But, yeah, I'm looking at the options because I need to watch Red Green. It's been <laughs> far too long. Yeah, it's a good show. It's a good time. He had a movie. Had... He did a movie as well. Yeah. Yeah, we had... I did um... not know that. Yeah. One of... And we all one... did little parts in the movie as well. One year, I, um, boy. I think... I can't remember if my brother bought it for my dad or if my dad bought it for my brother. They might have actually bought it for each other, but they got the stuffed and mounted um, sets for each other. I'm like... well, we, we each got a complimentary roll of red-green duct tape. Awesome. <laughs> that I still have somewhere out in the garage. That is awesome. <laughs> as well as a little wonderful. camp stool well, for sitting down on the movie set. Yeah. That's fantastic. That is so cool. So jumping from Red Green into X-Men, because we all know that's why we're here. We're, we're going <laughs> to talk about other things, but we're, we're also going to be like, no, we're X-Men. So... X-Men, the animated series, was my introduction into what has become the Marvel multiverse. Um, but then Beast also appeared in Spider-Man, the animated series, which crossed over with other Marvel animation shows of the time, making what was the original version of the MCU. But you also had a role on Mutant X, which was basically about the mutants, but Marvel was able to make it without violating Fox's then control. Well, over there it. was, in fact, a... a very lengthy lawsuit that went on about there was, that there was but and i try not to talk about it while i'm working for uh my uh my present employer so it's probably safe we're yeah. gonna avoid that topic <laughs> but what is it about the characters that you think is so compelling that we're still finding new ways to tell their stories in some cases 60 years later um because beast was first was one of the first mutants introduced in 1963 yes well i was one of the people that uh, found the x-men comic book sitting right next to the dc comics that i used to buy in 1962 when they came out with the very first x-men and i uh, wish i'd kept it so oh. i don't know what happened to it i think my mom threw out all my comic books and baseball cards oh it happens that this was way before we even knew that they were going to be worth any money mm -hmm. to her they were just he doesn't live here anymore why is his stuff still in the house <laughs> and bunch of bunch of old baseball cards who could possibly want those right <laughs> but anyway uh these characters are virtually timeless because they deal with the human condition and the uh the prejudice that exists in almost every human being and the fight for the people who are uh, underprivileged and disadvantaged. So this is why all these people found refuge in our show, because it showed that you could overcome your deficiencies and your, uh, your liabilities and turn them into assets. And the fact that people were uh, cooperating in order to achieve their goals and that uh, right would eventually prevail, regardless of the trial trials and tribulations that you had gone through and they found solace in the fact that all these people who were persecuted had these powers that they could use indiscriminately but chose only to use for justice's sake and even the character of beast mirrored a lot of what i went through as a kid when 
Uh, I grew up in the 1950s, and, uh, you know, being a fat kid and dressed like a nerd was not exactly a great way to go to school. So I put up with a lot of stuff on the class, in, in the, the playground and stuff, and uh, learned some lessons about how far you can go as a big kid to defend yourself and what you can and can't do and how things could actually come back on you if you become an aggressor. So the character of Beast was somebody who would contain his emotions and his uh, ability to commit violence until it was absolutely necessary to resort to it. And he would always try and find a peaceful resolution to whatever situation they were in. But uh, if there was no other alternative, then, uh, well, he would kick some butt. He would. He's very, very good at it. <laughs> <laughs> But this is something that almost everybody can relate to that has had any kind of a, a problem going through school or any, just in life in general of, uh, of being disadvantaged or, uh, or picked on. And you find your solace in characters that can overcome that. And this is what we've heard over and over and over again at all the shows that we attend, was how the people would come home from school where they had been bullied and they'd watch our show, and this was what kept them going. Yeah. Uh, we had no idea that we were having this kind of an impact on people when we did the show. We didn't even know how popular we were. <laughs> uh -huh. yeah. uh, that's not something that the producers ever shared with us. And from what I understand, when we were talking to Julia and Eric, uh, the fan mail was piled up all along a hallway at the studio, and it was all those... You know, they looked like laundry baskets filled with fan mail. And we never That's knew awesome. that. We were just waiting to see whether we were going to get renewed and did another year or not. And right. they'd keep you hanging until the last possible second. So all we were worried about really was, do we do another year? Do we not? And we had no idea until we started doing these shows of how popular we really were and uh, what kind of an impact we were having on people's lives. And it's not something you really think about when you're doing a, a cartoon. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, we were just telling a story. You know, the difference yeah. to me, though, was that X-Men for its time was unlike a lot of the other animated series that were out there because you were tackling more, even though it was technically a kid's show, you were tackling more adult topics and and handling them in a way that even young people could identify with. And so I think that's where the biggest difference came in. It wasn't just that it was an animated series. It was an animated series with heart. It was an animated series that that really looked to reach out to its audience. And, and, and I, think, I think was written, you know, this is from the outside looking in. It always felt like it was written in such a way that it would do just that, that it would help those that were well, in those was, situations to identify. Absolutely. With this was their intention from the very beginning. And something that uh, I'm sure that if you, when you were talking to Julia and Eric, uh, they fought hard to keep yes. the uh, that texture of the show mm -hmm. going when the money people were saying, you know, we want something more like what's on the TV right now. This is this is not what we want. You mm -hmm. know, make it more cartoony. And uh, that's not what they wanted. That's not what the show was supposed to be about. Uh -huh. And uh, they fought hard to keep that uh, that going, and uh, as a result, it became what it is. Mm -hmm. Boy, I'm and so glad they still, did. And it's still, I mean, the show ended in 1997, but it is still, it still has that power wow. to the point with X Men '97 coming back. I mean, that is that is an incredible, lasting legacy of that show. Well, it sure is. But if you look at the world today. It's even more messed up than it was when we did the original oh, yeah. series. Mm -hmm. the intolerance that has found its way to the forefront. And I really don't want to get on a political soapbox here. But the world is really in a rotten state. Mm -hmm. And if uh, if we can add a little bit of solace to people who watch the show and, and find a little bit of gratification in that, then I think we've achieved our purpose. Yeah, absolutely. But, uh, we're more timely right now. The stories are more timely right now than they were 30 years ago. We, we are definitely in a world that more than ever, we need the superheroes now. <laughs> exactly. And I can, yeah. you know, from a, and from a fan's perspective to have them, that whole series come out on Disney plus where it could be watched again easily. 
Oh man, that was that was a whole lot of giggling in my house when I found uh, that on my Disney Plus. You know, I was like cl- kind of clicking through the new stuff. Oh my god, it's back! <laughs> and, and it just it, it hits that same that that inner child. Like you, oh, yeah. you push play on it, and the the theme song starts, and you're like, oh, it's after oh, school yeah. all over again. I need. Some Dunkaroos and a Capri Sun, <laughs> and come on, I'm good. Like, well, I have a funny story. I was going across the border to do a show down in the states because we live in Canada, mm-hmm. and I was telling the border guard I was going to Comic Con, and he says, "Oh, really? What are you going to do there?" I says, "I'll oh, just sign some autographs, meet some fans." And he goes, "Well, what show are you with?" And I said, "Well, I did X Men, and I was the Beast." And he said, "You go da 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 da." This is at the airport. <laughs> That's awesome. I was actually walking through the grocery store the other day, and somebody's phone rang, and it was the X Men theme song as their ringtone, and I'm like, "Wait, what? Where?" <laughs> that happened. That happened to me at Walmart about a week ago. Oh my gosh! Or well, not a week ago. It was a couple weeks ago when I was not, you know, death with COVID. Um, <laughs> but I was walking through the store, and I heard it. It was like a couple aisles over, and I'm like. I need to go find my new best friend. Where's that real phone ringing at? <laughs> yeah, it was like it was like two days ago. I heard it, and I'm like, hey, I'm gonna talk to. Them. It's like, it's like a, it's, bouncing it's like, through the store. It's like the bat signal for nerds. Just as soon as that song hits, it's like, Ooh, okay, we have a new best friend. <laughs> find the TV quick. <laughs> exactly. So George, we love hearing backstories about how our guests got to be where they are today. Or how they got into the business of the entertainment industry, and you've you've been in the business like twenty years before you even started X Men. So it's kind of a two part question: What is your backstory into getting into the entertainment industry, and how did you get into the X Men? I know you had mentioned you were kind of into the comics a little bit, and then how how did you get? That well, let's, let's start with your very first question, how I got into the business. Uh, I can blame this for uh, my very first girlfriend. Uh, I went to an all-boys school. She went to an all-girls school, and they were just around the corner from each other. Uh-huh. And uh, they were looking for, for guys to come and audition for their senior class play. And I got conned into going there. I, had to, <laughs> I sang my alma mater uh, as my audition piece, and the, the show was Oliver. And I got the part of Mr. Bumble. Okay. This was my senior year of high school in Cleveland. And we did the uh, the whole process. You know, I had a lot of fun during the, the rehearsal process, and I met some great people. We had a ball. And then on opening night, when I went out there and I started getting laughs and applause, and uh, I knew I got this was, I was hooked. So this is a heck of a great way to make a living if it's possible. And I was only at the time like 17 years old. Mm -hmm. And I decided that this was going to be something I would pursue when I went to college. And uh, I did. Uh, My parents were very much against it. So I had to maintain an English major saying, well, no, I'm studying to be a teacher, but I like theater, so I'm going to take a lot of theater courses. Mm -hmm. (laughs) <laughs> well, I ended up graduating with like 136 hours of theater courses and the bare minimum of English courses to still carry a major. <laughs> <clears throat> but I was so I did every every play I could possibly get into. I auditioned for everything. And then when I was finished uh, with the university, uh, I'd already done a year of apprenticeship to equity uh, during the summer theater. I got hired by uh, the Great Lake Shakespeare Festival as an apprentice. Mm. This was 1971. And the guy who was my mentor at the theater festival was uh, Robert Englund, the Freddy Krueger. Oh, uh-huh. yeah. And uh, he had just gotten his equity card a couple of years earlier. <clears throat> and so he was kind of coaching me on uh, how to learn the ropes and how to do auditions and all this. And we became pretty good buddies during that season and then I went back and finished my degree and uh, started going out and auditioning at age 20 and got nothing nowhere no how Uh, so I kind of bummed around for a while and did uh, some really crazy jobs uh, mostly security and bouncing I worked uh, as security for Larry Flint 
Oh, yeah. Is a bouncer in his hustler club. Mm -hmm. I worked uh, as a bouncer in this place called the Agora in Cleveland that was a, a rock and roll venue. It sat like 2,000 people. Uh, Bruce Springsteen came there to play before he became a big star. <laughs> so from there, I was doing a lot of security work and getting far away from theater. So I went back into graduate school. And there I got uh, an opportunity to audition for uh, the, the um, Trumpet in the Land, which is a, an outdoor drama in Southern Ohio. <laughs> and that's where I got my equity card. And I was invited to go to Canada by a Canadian director, got my work permit, did a bunch of plays up here, uh -huh. and established myself as a, as a Canadian actor because uh, there was so much opportunity here in the early 70s. Everything was just getting started, the small theaters. And uh, eventually I got into television and film. So... The career kind of shifted from where I was going to be down in the States to Toronto. And as far as X-Men, by that time, I'd already uh, done a whole whole slew of animation. Uh, I was in the uh, 1983 production of uh, The Land of the Ewoks. So I was already fairly well established in uh, the animation. And we all got this opportunity to audition for this new series called Project X because it was secret, it was just like anything. They they call everything Project X. So I'm starting to read the dialogue and everything, and I said, Project X, my foot, this is X-Men. <laughs> because I'd read the comics. Right. Uh, and yeah. very few of the other people that auditioned knew what they were actually reading for. And uh, I said, I'm going in to read for X-Men. My <laughs> God. You know, this was like when I got the part on uh, the land of the Ewoks. You know, I'm doing a George Lucas production. And Star Wars, this was, at that time, the most amazing movie that I'd ever seen in my life. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then to when it comes out in animation, to actually be a part of that, you know, it's a mind-blowing experience. And then when X-Men came along, I was already doing another George Lucas semi-production called Maniac Mansion, mm -hmm. which was a half-hour sitcom that was done by the people who did SCTV. Oh, Second yeah. City. Yeah. yeah. And I played a four-year-old kid that got mutated in his dad's atomic chamber. From a little boy, he turned into this giant. And uh, so then I got this. I was already shooting that series. And around the corner is where we were taping X-Men. And I used to leave the set to go and do a recording session around the corner at the sound studio dressed as a four-year-old kid riding through downtown Toronto on my motorcycle <laughs> wearing uh, kids overalls and uh, crazy little shirts filled with beavers and everything and <laughs> so it's been a, a heck of a ride I've been doing this last 1971 was my first professional job as an apprentice so that's now 51 52 years and still going you know, yeah yeah. Kind of scary. <laughs> That's so amazing, though. And I love, I love the number of actors specifically that get their start with Second City. Second City has done so many amazing yeah. things, and that is that is such a cool thing to get to be connected to. I mean, in addition to being connected to to X Men and the Star Wars universe, then to have the ties back to to Second City, and even the ties back to the Great Lakes Shakespeare Festival, like that is on my list of things I want to go. I want to. I like I know that they still do a small Shakespeare festival. I mean, small Shakespeare festival. I want to go. Yeah. And I also did a season at Stratford here in Canada. Oh, okay, gosh. I love that. Nice. Yeah, as soon as you mentioned Robert Unglund too, and I'm sitting over here with the. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's a heck of a nice guy. <laughs> and uh, we became really good buddies during that season. But as in all things, you know, it's hard to maintain any friendships over the long period of time because you're mm -hmm. all over the place. Sure. Yeah. yeah, you keep in touch for a while, and then you you just kind of fade into the distance, and that's what happens. That is such an incredible backstory, though. That is that is so cool to get into. You're gonna be an English major. <laughs> yeah, well, thank goodness I never did that because then I'd be a teacher, and I don't know if I'd be happy doing that. Uh, 
not to say that it's not a great profession to be in, but I just wasn't cut out for that. You know, I got my jollies being on stage and listening to the applause and uh, being able to to get laughs out of the audience. And uh, there's nothing like live theater. And uh, no, there's not. Uh, and and the, the shame is now that I haven't done it since 1986, and I'd probably drop dead of fright if I had to go out and do it now. <laughs> not to mention the fact that up here there's probably more Swiss cheese than there is. <laughs> And that's not just because of my age, but uh, we did bad things back in the 60s and 70s. <laughs> There's always that. <laughs> they might well, have been selfish. bad, but they were also fun. Oh, they were. And uh, and actually, it was a, a, a great learning experience. And uh, there were a lot of things that we did that uh, uh, people these days don't uh, don't understand, really. Uh -huh. I mean... Well I almost got a chance to go to Woodstock, and I said, ah, oh, no, I don't want to go, and uh, too many people. And you a know, bunch my... of my friends from university went, and they came back and said, man, you missed the best thing that ever happened. My dad did the same thing. My dad had a group of friends who was like, we're going to go to Woodstock, and he's like, I don't I don't want to go do that. There's too many people. Like, how do you give up an opportunity like well, that? Well, we didn't know again. You, you had no idea time. that There's... it was going to be what it was. Yeah. I yeah. mean, when I was at Stratford, I had a friend of mine who's uh, uh, an actress, and she came and said, you know, my brothers came up with this idea to, for a board game, and, uh, you know, we're, we're looking for people to put up $3,000. And, you know, three grand at that time when you were doing nothing but theater was a lot of dough. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. And I said, no, nah, forget it, you know. You know what the board game was? Trivial Pursuit. Oh. Oh, oh wow. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Wait, what so, you don't know, you don't know. That's the well, thing, no, right? and who knew? You know, right? The, who knew and, it was going to take off like that? There's and no everybody that, that all the all my buddies that did have the three grand to toss into it ended up in rehab mm -hmm. because too much money uh, all at once, you know, came in and they were all, all uh, going crazy. Gotcha, gotcha. <laughs> okay. okay. I mean, you could have had Trivial Pursuit, but instead you got Beast, and I think Beast is way. Well, better. I know this is uh, it's much better. Like the the. the the joy that I'm getting out of meeting the fans now at doing Comic Cons beats any amount of money that could have uh -huh. rolled through the awesome. door from a, a board game. Yeah, there you go. Even uh, if there are beast can... related questions in Trivial Pursuit, too. Yeah, I'm sure there are. I, <laughs> I, I do own a game, uh, the original. I did go out and buy it to see what all the fuss was about. But I've never paid attention to a lot of trivia. Especially when it came to sports. I knew absolutely nothing about sports. I gave up uh rooting for teams uh, i grew up in cleveland they oh, hadn't at the I'm time sad. i was living there you know 1948 <laughs> was the last time that the cleveland indians won anything and even though the cleveland browns did okay sometimes and i knew some of the guys because they were in my dad's army unit mm. uh he was in the reserves and uh leroy leroy green was okay. in his uh in his platoon he was a sergeant master mm. sergeant so the, this was another thing, upbringing. You know, when you when you have a, a drill instructor as your father, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you learn also, you learn some discipline. I also <laughs> understand though, growing up in the Great Lakes region, having having a struggle with with sports because I mean we're all in Michigan. You know how Michigan sports are. <laughs> exactly. I mean, we're sister states, and uh, we used to spend a lot of time. Our best friends uh, lived in Detroit. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we used to go there all the time, and they'd come down and visit us. I mean, it was only a three-hour drive. Yeah, it's not a it bad drive. It wasn't a big deal. I remember doing that drive in a 1948 Packard. Ooh. Oh, but, interesting. Uh, yes, I wish I had the Packard now. <laughs> Talk, let's say, talking about things that you wish you had from when you were younger, <laughs> boy, that'd be something to have. That'd be oh, a yeah, well, car. all the cars that the family had, you know. We, we had a Nash Metropolitan. My grandfather had a 1952 Kaiser. Oh, God. I mean, if these cars, this is like Jay Leno's garage. Yeah. Right. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. And now, a word from our show sponsor, Level Up Savers. Their link can be found in the show notes.
So speaking of things from, from way back, when I was doing my research uh, on you, George, one of the things that I, I come to understand is that you've been a stamp collector since the age of five. Yes. Um, and that you've even had opportunity to display your stamp collection internationally. And that also your grandfather, I believe, was also a stamp designer. Yes, he uh, was. He was time. an artist and an architect. And uh, back in the 1920s, uh, he was in the military, and he was a, an architect, an engineer, and an architect in the Hungarian Military Corps. And they had a national competition for a new round of coinage and a new round of airmail stamps. And he won okay. both. Wow. So it was his design that uh, was the uh, the one cent, well, in their currency, it was uh, filer. From the one cent to the 50 cent was his design. And then in the uh, airmail stamps, from the four cent to the 46 cent were his design. And he was only uh, like 24, 25 years old when he did that. Oh, that's cool. He was an amazing artist. It, well, his okay. last work was a, uh, a giant panorama painting of the Grand Canyon. Oh, my goodness. Oh, wow. And it's six feet high. And 333 feet long. Wow. Wow. And it and it logs the Grand Canyon from sunup to sundown. Hmm. And it's all sitting in my brother's basement. That sounds amazing. He's, we're trying desperately now to find a home for it because we're all getting old and we, none of us had kids. So we're the end of the line. Oh, man. And uh, I would, you know, we're, I would have to think there's on. a gallery somewhere that would love to. Well, have there that. is. My brother is lobbying very hard to get uh, the people at the Grand Canyon Museum mm. to take oh, it. That, well, yeah, that'd be great. You know, anybody that would even consider it. You know, we would. We're just looking to find a home for it. It is. Sure, my grandfather sure. in his deathbed gave that mission to my mother. You know, as his dying breath, find a place to put my painting. You know, and, then, <laughs> and then she passed away a couple of years ago, and the paintings are still sitting in my brother's basement. They were exhibited several times in Cleveland, but uh, they're just so huge, you know? It's like. Yeah. Well, that's a giant painting, but still. He didn't do things small. I think the smallest thing he ever did was the postage stamp. <laughs> you know? Sure, sure. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. Well, let me ask you one question about your stamp collection because you, you covered a lot of the things that I wanted to ask you about it without having a chance to ask you. So that was great. Thank <laughs> you. Um, so one, just one last note. So everybody has something when they collect something that means something the most of them. Like I can tell you which one of these Funko Pops is my most favorite and why it's my most favorite and all those different things. And, and I have other things that I collect and I can tell you which one of these means the most to me or why this one is my favorite. So when it comes to your stamps, do you have one that means something to you, whether not necessarily because of its monetary value? Well, my grandfather's stamps, who I think are the ones that uh, I've, I've sold off an awful lot of my collection already. Just simply because I've kind of grown weary of it. It's gotten to the point now where I really don't feel like exhibiting anymore. It's gotten very expensive and very political. Mm -hmm. And what do you do? I've got a, a, you know, a box full of medals from all the shows that I uh, exhibited at. And I really am not into spending any more money on <laughs> buying more stamps. And I'm instructed by my wife that uh, <laughs> if you don't get rid of it while you're alive, I have no idea what any of it is. So I've been very yeah. busy getting rid of it so that it doesn't become a burden on the people that are left behind. Hmm. Fair enough. But my grandfather's stamps are ones that I think I'm going to hang on to all the time because they mean, those are the ones that mean the most. A heart connection, understood, yeah. The, what, I, what I specialized in was the Hungarian inflationary period right after World War II. Okay. And to this date, it is the highest inflation that has ever been recorded. Uh, their monetary values were uh, gauged in one times ten to the twenty seventh power. <laughs> wow! So that's an incomprehensible quantity. That is insane. And uh, the currency was 
still wet from the printer when it became obsolete. That's how quickly their monetary value was devalued. Wow. wow. And it was a punitive uh, measure imposed on Hungary by the Soviet Union. Sure. Hmm. Being part but, of the Eastern uh, Bloc, yeah. Their currency was worthless, and uh, they had absolutely no reserves, and they had to pay crippling war reparations to the Soviet Union after the war, which bankrupted the country and resulted in that inflation. But it, it lasted a couple of years, and then it kind of stabilized. But it was definitely a punitive measure, because the same thing happened in Romania. They had a... Mm a massive inflation as well, but nothing compared to what uh, the Hungarians endured. And even today in Zimbabwe, they still haven't hit that 27th power, you know, after the number. <laughs> wow. Not quite. It's incomprehensible. <laughs> That's, That's crazy. That is bizarre. That is such a cool collection, though. Like, Yeah, I had a lot in. of fun with it, and it, 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 you know, it kept me out of trouble, really, because... Uh, Anytime I traveled, I'd go to the stamp shows and the stamp uh, stores and, and hunt there instead of sitting in bars and getting hammered. So I guess it was a See, and that <laughs> a good is actually, thing. That's actually something my husband and I have talked about is the we've got a four year old daughter. And if we get her hooked on something nerdy that she's going to want to collect, she's not going to have money for drugs. It'll be fine. Yes. <laughs> And stamp you know, collecting, everybody says it's nerdy, but there's a lot of people that, like, or Ernest Borgnine was a huge stamp collector. Mm -hmm. Franklin Roosevelt was a stamp collector. Now, these aren't dorky guys. Oh, no. And uh, I also rode motorcycles all my life, so I used to ride to the shows. I was followed. The, one of my best friends, he's passed away now, he, he ran security for the stamp shows, and he we became friends because he, he was following me around. He says, what is this biker <laughs> doing at the stamp shop? Because I'd show up in my letters. I'd park my Harley out in front of the uh, the stamp hall where the show was being held. And I'd go around to the different dealers and, you know, buy my stuff that I wanted to get for my collections. And he'd always follow me around. <laughs> and uh, he finally came over and introduced himself and he says I've asked around about you and everybody says you're a square shooter and, uh, so I, I'd like to get to know you and we became fast friends and we ended up traveling together to the different shows and exhibiting together his name was Warren Dixon and he was he was a, a gentleman's gentleman he was the nicest nice. guy in the world <laughs> I, I so think cool. I'm going to have to use your, your argument with my wife in the future when I go to buy Funko Pops now well, exactly. Like, you know, honey, I, could I could be, be sitting here... in a bar getting right. hammered right now. <laughs> I, I could be here at Target looking for new Funko Pops that I can't find other places, or I could go to the bar and get hammered. Which do you we'll prefer? That, I'm going to see if that works. I'm going to see yeah, if that works. Yeah, try it out. <laughs> so and if you get a rolling me... pin in the head, then don't blame me. I was going to say, send me a picture of the slap mark across your face when you yeah. say that to Shana. <laughs> Uh, the, the, after I've received my permanent contacts from my eyeglasses getting punched yeah. in my face. Yeah. <laughs> I'll let you. Oh, goodness. So, George, you've already talked about this a little bit. And I just, I'm going to say this out loud because it's fun to remind Tim that I don't personally remember 1985. That's, that's before my time. Um, but looking through your IMDb, and you've already talked about being um, in the Ewoks series. <laughs> I remember 1985. I'm sorry. It's not my fault. I had no control over when I was born. Anyway, your question, ma'am. <laughs> yeah, well, I can remember 1955. So it's... <laughs> she That's just good. likes throwing 85 into my face. So just, just go with it. <laughs> so the role of Chief Chirpa on droids and the Ewoks animated show caught my eye. So two part question. Would you ever be interested in repri reprising your role as Chirpa if Disney decided to restart the Ewok franchi franchise? Oh, I'd and... be re interested in reprising anything. Oh, yeah. As long as it's not roles that are too active anymore. I, I draw the line at that. <laughs> <laughs> Those days are gone. But in terms of animation, yeah, I love doing Ewoks. It was, that again, was so much fun. But all our voices for as Ewoks were, were mastered. Mm. You know, it was our original voice, but they compressed it to make uh -huh. it sound like chipmunks. Yeah. And is it just a coincidence that Chirpa's father's name is Buzza? Like, I love that they're Buzza <laughs> yeah. and Chirpa. <laughs> it's yeah, it is a coincidence. <laughs> so after I found that you worked on the Ewoks, I, I, I then wore my Ewok shirt. Because... Uh, 
but it also says endurable. <laughs> <laughs> but Ewoks are fun. I would, I mean, they I are. would love for they them are. to do more of the Ewok anime. They were my favorite characters in, uh, in when I saw Star Wars. I love those little guys. They're fantastic. I mean, Knee-high there are some bears. seriously questionable things about Ewoks when you realize that they just had a dress that fit Leia, but <laughs> it's okay. We're just not going to think about where that dress came from. <laughs> <laughs> Oh goodness, no! I love Ewoks. I, I that would be great if they reprise the animated show. That would be fun. Yeah, well, I, I don't know how much they're going to be doing of reprising things. Uh, I think it was a real fluke that X Men came back, and I think we can thank the the, the fans mm-hmm. for doing that, and also the fact that when Disney did put uh, X Men on Disney Plus, it became the number one show and and stayed there for weeks. Yes. So that was a a definite boost to yeah. them uh, changing their minds about bringing the show back. But every sh- every time we went to a Comic Con, people would ask us, "Do you think Disney will bring it back? Will they bring it back?" And we had no answer. We didn't know. I know Julia and uh, Eric and uh, Larry Houston all were lobbying for the show to be brought back. And uh, the fact that it did is just uh, an amazing. I mean, the, when we went back, you know, we're recording in the very same studio we did the original series. And whether they knew that and they did it on purpose or whether it was just a fluke, walking back, we are actually in the very same space, not just the, the building, but the same booth that we did the original recording. Oh. Oh, how cool. So nice. it was just so amazing. I said, well, this is like having a flashback. <laughs> you know, it's, uh, it's that's an amazing cool. feeling. It was so cool. I cannot wait for more X-Men. I'm excited. I got to get my daughter. Well, we've already, we've already recorded the first season. Oh. Yay! And uh, uh, they're saying they're going to be uh, releasing it sometime in the fall of this year. So. Oh. And this is not a secret. This is something that has been announced at mm-hmm. uh, L.A. Comic Con and San Diego Comic Con. Yeah, I keep forgetting it's 2023. I think that's it part is. of the problem. Oh, isn't that so hard to believe? And so when you no. said it was the fall, I'm like, wait a second, that was in 2020. Oh. Never mind. Never mind. I'm still processing 2020. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm still working through the emotional damage of 2020, and it's 2023. Like, so George, we all have a, a like a little piece of something that is really close to our hearts. What is a, a project or a less known project that you have worked on that is really close to your heart that you wish had gotten a little more love? Honey, I Shrunk the Kids, the TV series. Oh, yes. Oh, mm-hmm. yeah. Have not had so much fun or worked in a more loving and friendly environment than that show. And God bless Peter Scolari. God rest his soul. He was the most generous actor that I had ever worked with in my life. He's, he was a, a joy to work with. And uh, I only did two seasons of that. I was brought in in season two to be the next door neighbor. And uh, I just, I can't tell you how much fun I had on that show. It, all, it was like doing Three Stooges. You know, it's, it's, <laughs> every time he'd invent something, it would blow up in my face. And I spent so much time standing in front of an air cannon, having <laughs> all kinds of things fired at me, spaghetti, <laughs> vegetables, slop, slime, you name it. And uh, things going blowing up in my face. It's, it's, it's like being in the Three Stooges. Mm-hmm. That's fantastic. It was well, farce comedy. And what it, was like a funny moment that you had like behind set other than being blasted with everything? There weren't really very, like most of the fun actually happened on set. Hmm. You know, behind the scenes, we didn't play jokes on each other or anything like that. Uh, yeah, some of them, I had some jokes played on me. Uh, Barbara Woods would do things while I was trying to do dialogue to see if I could get distracted. I mean, that kind of stuff goes on all the time. Right. And it's whether you, you, you lose it or not is, uh, 
is kind of the test of your metal, you know. Oh, and, I'm, interesting. and the stakes are much higher when it happens to you on stage. Because if you, you know, it turns in, in, on the a set of a movie or a TV show, you know, if you've got the time and the budget, it ends up in the, uh, the, the gag reel. But if uh -huh. it happens on stage and you break or whatever, then, you know, you're kind of eating it out there. <laughs> I remember we were doing, uh, this is a Great Lake Shakespeare Festival, and we were doing a production of Taming of the Shrew. And Bruce Gray was playing Petruchio, and God bless him, he's, he's passed away now too. But during his big monologue, every night he would turn and face stage right and deliver this one line into the wings. So one night I, orga I organized a company moon where everybody <laughs> that was backstage lined up and dropped trow and, and mooned him just as he turned <laughs> and he broke up, he, he lost it. <laughs> he started to laugh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I mean, and, and when we were shooting uh, this movie, High Point, I was working with Richard Harris, and uh, he and I became kind of good buddies during the shoot, and we had a lot of scenes together. And at the end of the movie, I get shot, and I'm lying there, and I had this big handlebar mustache. And Richard Harris is notorious for his gags, and on stage as well. And... While he's there stroking my head and saying goodbye, he's taking my mustache and shoving it right up my nose. <laughs> <laughs> the whole thing. And by the end of the scene, I had this huge mustache all... And, and you're dead. So you can't move, you can't breathe. You know? <laughs> so That's this is fantastic. the kind of stuff that does go on. Right. Hey, you gotta have but I, fun. Don't, I don't remember uh, you know anything really that hilarious that when most of the hilarity was in the in the actual filming uh, that's we, awesome. we, we would crack up at, at a lot of the situations and now a word from our sponsor since 1982 vital signs and graphics has been helping professionals with all their image logo and design needs perhaps you're looking for signs and banners truck and trailer lettering business cards, brochures, or other image and marketing aids, Vital Signs and Graphics in-house design studio has you covered. From logos to apparel, start to finish, Vital Signs and Graphics has everything you need to look and feel professional. Call Rick at 231-652-3300. He'll get you noticed. Welcome back to the FSF Popcast. All right, so George, we have a, a lot of listeners uh, on our our Facebook group. We've also, you know, we so we put out some questions to them, uh, and also to our Twitter followers as well, and asked them if they had any questions for you about your characterization of Beast. Uh, so here's a couple of them. Uh, Zach Walliner wants to know how did your cameo in the first X Men film come about? Ah, well, as you know, the, when big Canadian, uh, big American productions come up to Canada to shoot, uh, there's a lot of little roles that are left over for the Canadian actors. <clears throat> and my agent put me up as, as a role of this trucker. Mm -hmm. And so I went in and I read for the role. And this guy that I knew was the uh, stunt coordinator for the show. And uh, I was auditioning for Brian Singer. And he told me, he says, you know, that's the guy that did the voice of Beast. And Brian Singer sat up and he says, you know, if it wasn't for your show, we wouldn't be doing this movie today. And he gave me the part of the uh, the trucker. That's oh, cool. That's awesome. So that's how that came about. Well, it's awesome that Singer recognized that because that's one of the things we talked about with Eric and Julia, that it had not been for your show, the superhero run of movies right. would not have been there. So very cool. Yeah. So also from our Twitter followers, also from Zach Woliner, and also from Solo Requiem, they both wanted to know what your favorite Beast quote is and if you have a favorite episode of the series. Absolutely. My favorite Beast quote is, My name is Mr. McCoy, madam, not Blue Boy. 
<laughs> and, <laughs> and the favorite episode, of course, is Beauty and the Beast, where Beast gets to fall in love and yeah. gets his heart broken because he realizes that if they get together, that uh, her life would be in danger. And so he walks away and uh, sheds a tear. And that is actually my favorite photo that I like to take to the shows is Beast shedding tears. That's, uh... But the one that people like the most is the one where Beast is hanging upside down reading Civil Disobedience. Which is also does... a good one. Yes. The episode where he does the, the speech from uh, the uh, Merchant of Venice. Yes. And he decides that he's going to break all of his friends out of jail and then he bends the bars back and says, I'm staying because I have to get my day in court. Mm -hmm. So that's a great episode as well. Excellent. He's such, I, I feel like he's such an underrated character. He's, he's, he's he is. He is. Well, he gave, became a much uh, more prominent character after the first season. He wasn't mm -hmm. even going to be a part of the regular cast. They were going to put him into a few episodes and then just kind of let him fade away. And after the first season, which I spent most of in jail, that's uh, they decided to bring Beast back full bore and uh, made him a permanent part of the mm -hmm. uh, the inner team, yes, which he is great. Where he belongs. Yes. I actually used to, I would play X-Men on the playground in elementary school because that was, I mean, we were watching X-Men after school and one of my friends figured out how to hang upside down from the monkey bars and pretended that he was reading just like Beast was. <laughs> Well, see, we did the same thing. We used to pretend we were Superman, and we jumped off the roof and... Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, hurt ourselves, tied a blanket around <laughs> as a cape, and said, hey, I can fly. And, yeah, you know, and, oh, well, I guess I can. I wonder what's My mother-in-law has stories about my about my husband doing that. He landed on a wood pile. He's got some pretty gnarly scars on his back from that. Yeah, well, I didn't know. <laughs> we had a, a little play shed that was attached to the garage mm -hmm. so that it wasn't exactly the, the full eight or ten feet it was maybe about six and a half seven feet off the ground so we didn't hit that hard yeah but no, we only we only did it once <laughs> it was it was when my husband and i were dating that my mother-in-law told me she's like you know there was a day that i was sitting in the living room and i realized i didn't know where john was and then i heard footsteps on the roof and i'm like how old was he oh uh, six and he's on the <laughs> roof well, yeah. I did that too. I I went up on the roof. This was that had nothing to do with being Superman. I just like to be in high places. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and there was a ladder that was on the. I lived, grew up in an old A-frame, so it was like two and a half stories high with the peak. Mm -hmm. And there was a ladder leaned up against the house because my dad was doing something and it was still there. So I climbed up on the roof of the porch, pulled the ladder up after me, put the ladder up to the peak of the A-frame, and went up there and sat there. And then I was too scared to come down. And uh, and I was like maybe six, seven, if that. And I sat up there for a while until my mom noticed that I wasn't around. And then she came out and saw me up there. I said, I can't get down. Help me. Well, you have the ladder now. <laughs> I know. This was the thing is I had the ladder. <laughs> you know? So oh. she called my grandfather and he had to climb out through the window of their bedroom and then get the ladder and get me down. And... <laughs> oh my goodness. Uh, That's fantastic. Stuff we did. That's great. Well, I had more of a, a silly, serious question. Uh, it is, what is your favorite place or where is your favorite place to eat and why? Home, because I cook it and I make things deadly hot. Mm. Mm. deadly hot i grew my own hot peppers i had a garden in the back i have eight gallons of hot sauce sitting in my freezer Oof. i and got it, indigestion just hearing about all this yeah well <laughs> i grew a, a whole field of reaper plants oh. scorpion peppers oh wow uh, jalokia peppers and i made my own hot sauce and i enjoy burning people <laughs> so my mild salsa you would laugh at okay gotcha all right i have a pot of chili that's cooking on the stove right now as we speak 
Oh, mm, my gosh. Waiting, waiting for a, a good dollop of uh, some Reaper sauce in there. Oh. I love, I love oh. hot food. Oh, I'll be man. right over. <laughs> and I, I travel, I travel with my own jar, the the limit that you're allowed to take on a plane. And uh, I remember the there was this guy at a comic con, and he was trying to raise money for some uh, uh, for some charity, and he had a, a bottle of hot sauce. And he says, "I'm going to take a big swig out of this for twenty bucks." And he slams it down on my table, and he goes. 300,000 Scoville units. I'm like, oh, really? <laughs> so I reached down into my bag and pulled out a bottle of the uh, my own hot pepper sauce of the Reaper, and I'm like, hey, 1,300,000 Scoville units. And he kind of like, oh. I said, here, have a swig. <laughs> the top of his head oh, blew off. It was... I bet. I think the most I had was 6 million. <laughs> Oh, that's that's up there. It was. I was like, oh, oh this is pretty bad. <laughs> there is this guy on YouTube. Hard pass. That, I, I I cry if my nacho cheese is too hot. I saw this guy take a a reaper pepper, slice the top of it off, core it out, and then take a jar of six million Scoville unit hot sauce, and fill up the pepper, like a stuffed pepper pop it in his mouth and this is on youtube and and eat it and like you could see his eyes had glazed over and this the sweat was pouring out of him but he didn't die but people have and it, it can actually burn through your esophagus yeah, so you do yeah, have yeah. to be careful this the whole bravura you know the bums have de decided they can get high by drinking an entire bottle of serious hot sauce hmm. and uh they've they've actually ended up in cardiac arrest because it, it does have that effect in a, in a mass quantity like anything you know if, yeah if you decide to sit down and eat a five pound bag of sugar chances are you're gonna you'll die mm -hmm. you know, anything it's just too much moderation, anything yeah. in that my in that quantity is is bad oh. mm -hmm. no but i like you. my food to have a kick Jeez. See, I'm more Why? afraid of I'm more afraid of the, the kick it would give me afterwards. Yeah, see, so. I, I've never been bothered by that. <laughs> see, I've I like had... some level of spice. I just my body doesn't like the spice that I put. Well, it's into not it for and... everybody. Mm -mm. So I, I am not. To... I am not a spice person. I'm, my hey, wife thinks the you know spice ends at salt and pepper. <laughs> Every once in a while, I get really crazy. Put a little bit of medium salsa on my food. Oh yeah. How how is that 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 seems to be how it works out though? Is you have the spouse who wants to burn a hole in their mouth with the spicy food, and then you have the person who can barely handle pepper. Like my sister and my brother in law are like that. My brother in law is like you. He loves spicy things. He wants spicier the better. And my sister anything hotter than mild salsa and she can't do it like and he's... Well, you don't ask a person when you're about to marry them uh, you know, well true. what kind of food do you eat oh, i'm <laughs> sorry i can't marry you, you know. you're adorably but cute but sorry you can't eat uh jalapenos this isn't gonna work well it's, like... it's very easy i just don't put it in everything i cook that's true you know, My brother it's so is... easy to add it afterwards you don't have to well i'm sorry i made this whole pot of chili so that nobody else can eat it yeah my brother-in-law has made his own, um, I think it was ghost chili. He had ghost chili pepper sauce. And he had a just a little bit of it on his lip, and he kissed my sister, and she thought she was going to die. He's like, yeah. it's not that spicy. No. She's like, really? Because I argue with that. <laughs> Every time I kiss my wife, she says, what have you been eating? Mm -hmm. <laughs> said, nothing, nothing, nothing. Right? Nothing. Are you sure? Positive. Because... Yeah, and she'll sniff. Have you been eating fish? Did you eat any of those stinky, awful things? <laughs> or hot sauce? Have you eaten any hot sauce? Because don't come near me. Because I've burned her just by not mindlessly eating something, and then I give her a kiss, and then. <gasps> mm -hmm. <laughs> and yeah. you just there's no cure for that. You just gotta wait until it wears off. Yeah. All right, George, we're at a spot in our show where we like to take our guests through a little bit of a quiz. 
And so we're going to throw a little bit of trivia at you. It's not Trivial Pursuit, uh, <laughs> since we already let that one sail by in life. Uh, this is just a quick little bit of X-Men trivia. There's four questions. They're all multiple choice. If you get three out of the four questions correct, we want to send you this book right here. It's called Custodians of the Cosmos. Uh, and this book is written about a young man who wanted to join something quite like Starfleet, uh, but not Starfleet for litigious reasons. Uh, but uh, he rejoined uh, as a custodian so he could boldly clean up after those who boldly just went. So, um, now, however, if there's good things, there must be not so good things. If you get two questions or less correct, we take your picture, we make a meme out of you, and we put you into our 210,000 member Facebook group. We call it our fun sequence. Ah, the people who have absolutely no idea for a lot of trivia. Fine. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, let's, so we've got, like I said, four questions. They're all multiple choice. And uh, so Nick and, and Kathleen are going to ask those of you. Question number one. What is Magneto's real name? Is it A, Eric Lencher, B, Dr. Nathaniel Essex, or C, Kane Marco? The first one. You are correct. All right. Good job. All right. Question, num question number two. Which of the following characters does not have blue skin or fur? A, Beast, B, Jubilee, or C, Mystique? Jubilee. That is correct. Very good. Which pairing has the ability to read minds? Is it A, Wolverine and Cyclops, B, Gambit and Rogue, or C, Jean Grey and Professor X? Jean Grey and Professor X. Very good. All right. So that's three. That gets you the book. And uh, we'll we'll get an address from you in a little bit. You have escaped uh, how to, how the to... land of the fun sequence. <laughs> exactly. You are fun sequence free, but uh, we'll still make sure you get the book. And question number four to put Tim's quiz to shame. For funsies. <laughs> put Tim to shame, which is fun for the rest of us. Which X-Men can charge animate and inanimate objects with kinetic energy? A... Rogue, B, Gambit, or C, Cyclops? Rogue. That is actually not correct, according but to... But technically, it is correct, because if she were to touch Gambit, then she That's could true. also do it. But the answer is Gambit. Ah. Oh, well, there's that. <laughs> well. Tim, Tim stumped you on one of them. <laughs> it's not a complete decimation. I'll take it. All right. You redeemed uh, yourself I'm, just a little bit, Tim. I'd say perhaps. half points because Rogue could hey, technically just, you know be what? correct. Nick, shush, shush. Nobody asked you, Nick. <laughs> just shush. <laughs> Let me have this one. I'll take well, my I'll take my mark. You still like get him. a book. I like this guy. We're gonna work. We'll be okay. Well, George, thanks so much for being on the show today. Where can our listeners go to find out more about you and your works? Unfortunately, I'm not on any social media. So, uh, I really don't know. IMDB? Uh, IMDB, which I find is totally inaccurate in a lot of regards. It sure uh, is. <laughs> SAG just got through some major negotiations with IMDB allowing SAG members to access their own sites and claim them and correct any huh. accept certain things where you have to document and everything so i tried to go in there and, and update it and i felt like i was in a hamster cage you know going around and around and around in circles without being able to achieve anything some and of the things on, i said uh, yeah. who cares you know if they want to believe all this stuff that's not true or not up to date who cares what difference does it make understood because they have so many things wrong not necessarily about my work, but about my personal life. Mm -hmm. I mean, you really wonder where did they get the information? Because mm -hmm. there's a lot of things that are wrong. My birth date is wrong. They've got me much older than I really am. Then, you know, at my age, come on, give me a break. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Let's not push this any further really, forward. Yeah. Really, don't push me into the grave before time is. <laughs> but they have me born in the 40s whereas uh, okay. i wasn't 
and uh, Cedric was Professor X, but not me. Go. So give me those few years. But I gave up trying to correct it. Understood. Yeah, it can be it can be difficult to try and correct some of the stuff on IMDb. We use IMDb to, uh, you know, for some content issues and things like that. But if there's any mistakes made, you know, good luck trying to get it changed. It's, it can no be kidding. Difficult. And it's all personal stuff that doesn't really matter except, right. you know, the people who would take it personally, like me. Right, exactly. Mm -hmm. They got all the work stuff right. They've got okay. all the credits correct. But uh, yeah, there, is, so... there is one credit that I don't, I don't know if it's actually showed up there. But uh, it's, a, it's a, a fun fact, as they would say on uh, uh, fun factoid on mm -hmm. Big Bang Theory. Uh, back in 1983, I did the show called The Sex and Violence Family Hour for Playboy. And it was written by one of the guys that was uh, the original writers on Laugh-In. Okay. And it was done in the exact same genre as Laugh-In with the short skits. And uh, it starred Jim Carrey, uh, Murray Langston, who was the unknown comic, the guy with the paper bag over mm -hmm. his head. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. And uh, it, was, it was really cheap, cheap comedy. <laughs> so... I keep wanting, and it, there's this one scene of me in a wearing like a speedo and uh, black leather chaps, and a black leather vest, and nothing else, and two girls in very skimpy bikinis, holding on to a chain attached to a collar around my neck, and we're all go-go dancers. Oh my! <laughs> <laughs> <Ooh>. <laughs> And I, I keep wanting to get it. The, the picture resolution is so bad on the one that you can get off the internet. Because, of course, in 1983, we didn't have high resolution anything. Sure. Right. And I'd love to lay that on the table, you know, for signing at one of the Comic Con. <laughs> 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 oh, goodness. Oh, there's well, got to be somebody out there with one. So. Probably. Well, well check we... it out. If you're, if you're in for a good laugh. <laughs> yeah. All right. We will definitely encourage our viewers and our listeners to look at your IMDb, but take things with a grain of salt. Know that the internet yes. lies. Abraham yes, Lincoln does. told us so. And, <laughs> and thanks to Elon Musk, there. it'll continue doing so. Yes. There sure. <laughs> They're on band now. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Scary accurate. Well, we also want to take this moment to remember and that uh, or remind you guys rather that subscribing is the single most important thing that you can do to help us ensure that we get a more amazing guests like George Buza here today and funny moments for you to be able to listen to. So please subscribe to the show. It helps out well more than we can know. But we also want you to go check out George's work as well. And if you can find that happy hour picture, George would love it. So just you know, <laughs> keep that Have in mind. Have a laugh on me. Exactly. Now, if for whatever reason you are not happy with the content of our show today, please feel free to lodge a complaint with the head of our complaint department. That, of course, is Hank McCoy, a.k.a. Beast, from the X-Men. Remember, big and blue fur isn't the only mutation he has. He's incredibly intelligent, and when annoyed, he also has one incredible heck of a temper. So, <laughs> submit two copies of your complaint, and he'll read it over and... See the validity of your complaint, we're sure. Look, we know us. We know that, you know, we're we're mod mediocre podcasters with some issues. We understand that. So when he will come for us, it will happen. We just hope that it's for a discussion on better podcasting tactics and not so much with that whole anger thing, if you know what I mean. <laughs> oh, goodness. Uh... All right. Well, George, thank you so much for being on the show today that we've really appreciated your time and, and, and had so, just a joy talking with you. Well, thanks very much for having me. I've had a great time. Oh, thanks thank a lot. Thank you. This was, this was amazing. All right, guys, that's going to conclude us for the FSF Popcast. Come on. That's all, folks. Ciao. On behalf of the rest of the hosts of the FSF Popcast, we want to thank you for listening to this episode. If you'd like to be a guest on a future episode, please contact us by means of Twitter or Instagram using the handle at FSF Popcast or go to www.fsfpopcast.com and click on the contact me link. 
Thanks again and hope you enjoyed the episode.